And then finally, we um, did some interview research to try to look at you know, what's happening in our local community around this issue. How are people responding? What impact does it have? So we interviewed, uh, in primarily in focus groups, 28 people living with HIV and 25 service providers. And I was going to quickly, yeah, okay, I'll just quickly go over some of, the, some of the key sort of findings from that part of the work. The first is that, you know, without question, uh, this sort of constant or consistent emphasis on uh, the how the significant risk test is such a problem because of its vagueness and lack of definition. Um, it, many people living with HIV would continually refer to how it doesn't provide uh, a useful guide to them in their day-to-day -day sexual lives because it's such an abstract concept that's not translated into a sort of embodied daily sexual practice. And so that leads to considerable fear and uncertainty on their part and on the part of counselors and others working on the front line about what you know, puts people at risk of prosecution. Um, another important finding is um, that people uh, often express that they were, had very little confidence that they were, would be protected from criminal prosecutions or, or even if they did disclose. Um, and that was particularly common amongst women that we spoke with, which then poses you know, a whole series of questions about the, the usefulness of this type of law and the possibilities for it to have any kind of deterrence. And the final point in terms of uh, the findings is that uh, the ways in which the, the lack of clarity around significant risk leads to a series of problems in counseling and HIV prevention. And the first is the way it leads to a disinclination to seek support for disclosure. So on a formal institutional organizational level, disclosure is everywhere, right? Everyone's talking about disclosure. The criminal law requires disclosure. Public health are now like talking about disclosure. They're, they're, using, they're emphasizing disclosure in their counseling. So disclosure has a new prominence institutionally and organizationally, and organizationally in the governance of, of, of transmission and, and, and in an HIV prevention work. But on the ground, when you talk with people, what you find is that because of criminalization and the fears that people have about being open about what's happening in their lives, they're less off, some people are less inclined, particularly those who are, in, you know, are not disclosing, right? They're less inclined to actually seek support and be able to speak openly and frankly about that with their, provi with their you know, service providers and counselors for fear that they may, be get caught up, they may get caught up in some type of criminal proceeding. A second point, as you might imagine, given the complexity and sort of uncertainty associated with the legal test, there's a lot of count contradictory counseling approaches. We saw that in how people themselves explained their own understanding of significant risk and in their own accounts about how they recognized there were differences in, their, in how they and their colleagues approached the issue. So not a good recipe for good at HIV prevention when there are a lot of mixed messages happening. And finally, um, what we found is that uh, that some providers, particularly in public health, have moved to counsel their clients to disclose in all circumstances. So this has the effect of eliminating risk from governance, right? which is kind of weird given the prominence of risk in governing health practice. Um, and what it does is also ratchet up potentially the uh, significant risk test because when that type of counseling advice is documented and entered into court proceedings, it can be interpreted by judges as, as, what, as, what, the, uh, what significant, uh, as what significant risk means. So just, do I have just a second to do this? Okay. So in terms of the policy options, we identify three in, in the, the report. The first is a sort of status quo approach to continue with a case-by-case -case, uh, interpretation and intervention in cases. The problem with this approach is that, you know, the lower court decisions that have occurred thus far have not really clarified the significant risk test, and it takes a lot of time for, these, for court decisions to be appealed up to the Supreme Court level. The other problem with this policy option is that it presents no leadership role for the ministry. You know, it doesn't put any... Uh, responsibility on them to do something about the issue. A second policy option is to advocate for a criminal code amendment and I think we all know that the federal government agenda in the criminal justice sphere is far from evidence-based so this is really you know, you know Harper is not going to you know 
run off and make a, b a bunch of adjustments to the criminal code in ways that we would like. So the final one that we're sort of left with is to try to encourage the ministry to develop um, the prosecutorial guidelines. And the thinking here is that such guidelines could help clarify people's legal obligations, could clarify the public interest uh, uh, consideration that's required for moving forward with charges, with cases. Um, it would help to, to ensure that cases are in, when in their handling are informed by current science. Um, it could ha ensure that complaints are handled in a fair and non-discriminatory fashion and help prevent unwarranted charges such as the oral sex type cases that we've heard about from, from even occurring and moving forward in the system. So, thanks. So I'd like to thank all our, our, our panelists. What we've heard is a lot of stuff about the law and the effects that the law is having on not only the lives of people living with HIV and AIDS, but our ability to begin to, uh, to continue to fight the, the epidemic. So the question that uh, we're faced with is, like, what can we do about it? And Eric began to touch on that at the end. Uh, the Ontario Working Group has been um, uh, working on this for the last three years, and we've attempted to be, I think, the voice of reason in some very difficult times, especially uh, at times when there's been some high-profile um, court cases with uh, really lurid media coverage that um, I would say have made people living with AIDS and HIV the subject of some pretty uh, vitriolic attack and, and defamation. And I think we also have to recognize that this is an issue that has divided the community as well, right? between um, positive and neg negative people, uh, between people who see that criminal law is a a way of protecting vulnerable people to others who say that it's a way of, you know, destroying the lives of vulnerable people. I mean, it's, this has not been an easy discussion, even among people who we have come to expect to be our allies, right? So it's been quite, it's been quite difficult. And I think as we became aware of those difficulties and the damage that was being done, uh, we realized that this was um, not something that we could adequately address by better sound bites to the media, right? I mean, that, that simply wasn't enough. Um, or by trying to acquaint people with their rights and responsibilities under the law. You know, people's knowledge of the law sometimes, and the, given this, the unclarity of the law, really didn't help very much in terms of whether they were going to be prosecuted or not. Um, nor was it being helped by kind of a theoretical debate about whether the law did or did not have any role in it. Right? Because the problem was, we have a Supreme Court decision that the law was taking a role in this, and, uh, and we were having to deal with that on a, on a daily basis. Um, so, we, were try we, we spent a lot of time trying to figure out, especially after those last trials uh, about a year ago, what the best option would be. Something that would be um, concrete and practical and strategic uh, that we could make an intervention in. Uh, and I think that our, our thinking could be best described as um, harm reduction. That we're in a, this is a mess, right? And what we have to do right now is to try to limit the amount of harm that is going to cause to individuals in our community, to our community unity as a whole, and to the fight against the unions. Uh, Eric talked a little bit about those three options. That, uh, Going to, going to Parliament and asking for new laws didn't seem to be much of an option. The courts were a second one. In fact, we have spent uh, quite a bit of energy and resources on working that way. We have to get, we've brought together a group of quite seasoned criminal lawyers who put their heads together and begun to really hone arguments that can be used in this case uh, to make sure that they really understand all of the, uh, the nuances around uh, significant risk. And we've also brought together a, a stable of expert witnesses who can go into courts uh, as doctors, as scientists, uh, as epidemiologists and talk about uh, what's there. Because some of those early cases, really, people were not getting a proper defense. And that, of course, is a very important piece of work. But, as we know, um, sometimes even before people get to court, their picture and name is appearing in the paper as the police go on these um, uh, fishing expeditions. Or they spend time in jail, waiting, waiting for court, waiting for bail. Or even if they're acquitted, they go through this incredible trauma of seeing their life uh, in the hands of somebody else who knows absolutely nothing about what they're experiencing and their, their future kind of in the balance there. So uh, simply fighting it in the court, simply getting acquittals didn't seem to us to be enough. And that third, that third um, option, the one developing uh, prosecutorial guidelines, 
seem to be kind of a key one in terms of harm reduction in this kind of situation. 